subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go. We'll begin with this explained article, Center Constitutes 22nd Law Commission. What role does this body play? Central government has constituted 22nd Law Commission with a term of three years. The term of 21st Law Commission ended in 2018. In 2020, central government approved the constitution of 22nd Law Commission. After approval, the constitution of the commission was pending. And now finally, the Law Commission has been constituted. We will discuss this topic in a little bit of detail, giving justice to the work that the Law Commission of India does. First of all, it is an ad hoc body. As and when the central government feels the need of it, it is constituted. Law Commission of India presently is a non-statutory body. Although the first Law Commission that was said in British India, that came out of a law. Law Commission of India is an advisory body that, which gives recommendation to the Ministry of Law and Justice. Basically, it works in close coordination with the Department of Legal Affairs. First Law Commission in India was established in 1834. You would like to remember this. This commission was set up by the Charter Act of 1833. And now, of course, you will remember from the knowledge of your history that it was chaired by Lord Macaulay. Lord Macaulay brought many reform in India which you have to know as part of your reading in history and he is very prominently remembered for Indian Penal Code of 1860. Post-independence, the first Law Commission was set up in 1955. The Law Commission is generally chaired by a retired judge of a Supreme Court or a retired Chief Justice of the High Court. For instance, this time, the 22nd Law Commission is headed by the retired Chief Justice of Karnataka High Court. The 21st Law Commission was headed by a retired Judge of Supreme Court. Then there is a Secretary to Law Commission of India. There are two permanent members who are also the retired judges. There are two part-time members who are legal experts. And there are two ex-officio members. The Law and Legislative Secretaries in the Law Ministry, they are the ex-officio members of the Commission. You must know this. Law Commission are generally given references by the government for the area in which they have to work. But you should know that the Law Commission of India can also work so moto. So it does act as an independent body for legal reform and policy formulation. You would understand the role that the Law Commission of India plays if we just go through the terms of reference of 22nd Law Commission of India. The basic tasks that Government of India hands over to the Law Commission are these to review or repeal obsolete laws. The Commission is also to examine the laws which affect the poor. They have to look into the relation between law and poverty. They have to review the justice delivery system. They have to examine the procedure and recommend to reduce the delays, make the judicial administration more effective. They have to examine the laws in the lights of directive principles of state policy. They have to see if laws are promoting gender equality. You must also know for your prelims exam that the Law Commission of India must also consider the request for providing research to any foreign countries if the reference has been made to it by the government. And the Law Commission of India also examines the impact of globalization. This is directly from your syllabus. The impact of globalization on food security, unemployment and recommend measures for the protection of the interest of the marginalized. The Law Commission of India plays a very diverse role in improving the legislation in the country, in suggesting various model laws, bills and policy changes. The most basic job that Law Commission of India perform is to review or repeal the obsolete laws. Under this, the Commission must look for laws which are no longer relevant. The laws which are not in harmony. So basically the role so basically the role that the law commission the commission must also give measures for quick redressal of citizens' grievances concerning any legislation. Law Commission of India and its report also examine the laws which affect the poor, the vulnerable. They must also do the post audit for socio-economic legislations. And they must look for ways and means in which laws can be used to serve the poor. Another very important task of Law Commission of India is to look into administration of justice as to how legal administration is being carried out. 
Law Commission of India suggests ways to eliminate delays. Do speedy clearances, quick and economical disposal of cases, and all of these without violating the cardinal principle of justice and fairness. So Law Commission of India looks into the measures of using devices. Using electronic devices, e-governance, live telecast of court proceedings. Using various technology for evidence, for example, DNA profiling, etc. Fast track courts that exist for various cases, even in commercial cases or women related cases, all those have been recommended by previous law commissions. Apart from these, Law Commission of India must also examine the impact of globalization as we have seen on food security, unemployment or any other issue Law Commission of India can take up so moto. The commission can also provide the research assistance to foreign countries. The commission gives ways and means to promote gender equality using law as a tool. And the commission must examine the existing laws in the light of directive principle of state policy and suggest some legislations to improve the implementation of DPSP to attain the objectives that has been set out in the preamble of our constitution. So these largely are the role played by Law Commission of India. And in this role, Law Commission of India has been quite successful. Many policy important legislations they are the outcome of recommendations made by the Law Commission of India and its report. In the pre-independence era, many important legislations like Religious Endowments Act, Official Trustees Act, Female Infanticide Prevention Act of 1870, the Code of Criminal Procedure that was revised in 1872, the Indian Contract Act of 1872, Indian Evidence Act of 1872, also the Special Marriages Act, all these are outcome of the recommendations by the Law Commissions. In the post-independence era, Law Commission has a long record of successful law reforms in India. So far, 277 reports have been submitted by Law Commission. And according to the own analysis of Law Commission of India, 92 reports stand implemented. And there are many other recommendations partially implemented by other reports. So it has been judged that around 43% of the recommendation of Law Commission of India has been accepted and implemented by the government of India. Not bad, not bad. For example, enactment of a new code of criminal procedure in 1973 was the result of 41st report of Law Commission of India that did reading of previous reports of Law Commission of India as well. Reports concerning the same topic. The Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act, RTE of 2009, that is also an outcome of recommendation of Law Commission of India. 186 report of Law Commission of India recommended for establishment of a tribunal like National Green Tribunal. It also gave a bill in the annexia for National Green Tribunal Act 2010. Four very important reports from 248 to 251. These reports recommended for repealing laws that have become obsolete and around 1500 central acts were repealed after the recommendations from these reports. The Commercial Court, Commercial Division and Commercial Appellate Division, High Court Bill 2015. This was introduced on the recommendation of Law Commission. Because if you remember, one of the core job in the hand of Law Commission of India is, is to make administration of justice effective and efficient. So there's a need of a speedy trial without compromise on the cardinal principles of justice and fairness. So Law Commission of India keep giving recommendation as to how to improve administration of justice. In the 246 report, Law Commission of India recommended to amend the Arbitration and Reconciliation Act 1996. And the model for the bill that was presented in 2015 was, was also framed by the Law Commission of India. Law Commission of India has recommended many electoral reforms. Many of that has been accepted by Government of India. There are certain recommendations that have not been accepted in totality yet, but they are an important recommendation by Law Commission of India. For instance, in 262nd report, now you don't have to remember all the numbers, but things which are making round in news and you're expecting that the topic is important for the coming mains exam, for those you might like to remember the report number. It adds weightage to your argument. But even if you don't remember, it's quite okay. You need to know what recommendations in which areas Law Commission of India has made. That at least you must keep in your mind. In 262nd report, Law Commission recommended for abolition of debt penalty for all crimes except terrorism-related offenses and offenses of waging war against the state. 
This de facto is being practiced in India. Law Commission of India in its 170th report on reform on electoral laws back in 1999 had suggested simultaneous Lok Sabha and state assembly elections. Law Commission was of opinion that this is going to improve governance and stability. Criminal Procedure Identification Act of 2022 that has replaced the Identification of Prisoners Act of 1920 was also proposed by Law Commission of India. This legislation, Identification of Prisoners Act 1920, used to take data, information from the prisoners in the form of photograph or otherwise, and that can also be coercive. So that was changed in Criminal Procedure Identification Act 2022. The 21st Law Commission of India, as we now know that its tenure ended in 2018. In one of its recommendations, the commission said that uniform civil code is neither necessary nor desirable at this stage. So just to reiterate the point that Law Commission of India is an independent legal reform and policy formulation body. It can also take up important legal and policy related issues, so moto. Now let's look into some of the recommendations made by the last Law Commission, 21st Law Commission of India. It has submitted 15 reports from report number 263 to 277. Report number 277 is titled as Wrongful Prosecution, Miscarriage of Justice, Legal Remedies. In this report, the Law Commission of India has recommended creating a statutory obligation on the state to compensate the victims of wrongful prosecution. The commission has elaborately discussed as to how to identify and what should be the criteria for judging wrongful prosecution. So a law must be passed and it must be the statutory obligation on the state to compensate the victims because even if the victim has been released, the loss the victim has suffered on account of his or her right under Article 21 is huge. So that calls for some kind of compensation, at least monetary compensation. For this, there must be special codes. But these special codes must function very effectively because what has happened here, wrongful prosecution, that should not happen here again. The 276 report of Law Commission of India is titled Legal Framework, Gambling and Sports Betting including, including Cricket in India. Very elaborately, the Law Commission of India has discussed the problem of gambling in India and recommended that law must regulate gambling rather than a blanket ban on gambling. The 275th report is titled BCCI Vis-a-vis -vis Right to Information Act 2005. Here, the Law Commission of India has discussed many case studies. In detail, the Law Commission of India has tried to distinguish between state and public authority under the ambit of Article 12. And very elaborately, Law Commission of India discussed whether the Board of Control for Cricket in India, BCCI, should fall under the purview of Right to Information Act. And the answer is yes. The recommendation given by Law Commission of India is that BCCI would have to be covered under the RTI regime. Law Commission of India also has discussed the topic of Contempt of Court Act 1971. This has been making news for quite some time. Recently, you must also have heard the case of MS Dhoni filing a case of Contempt of Court. Law Commission in its 274th report has discussed the topic and recommended that Commission does not consider it necessary to make any changes, to make any amendment therein meaning the amendment in contempt of court act 1971 for the present. This act has been amended twice and government of India gave a term of reference to law commission of India whether the act should be amended again. The recommendation is no. The 273rd report of law commission of India is titled implementation of United Nations convention against torture and other cruel inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. In short, this is called as United Nations Convention Against Torture. The Law Commission has said in order to tide over the difficulties that India many a times face in criminal extradition because there is absence of any anti-torture law in India. This is the argument that Vijay Malaya was pitching in the court in London. And also to otherwise secure right to life and liberty, the Law Commission has recommended considering the ratification of Convention Against Torture. And they also have given a model bill. Once the government ratifies it, it has, to, it has to come up with a law against torture. So that law can come out of a model bill that the Commission has provided in the report. See, if you go to Law Commission of India's website, you will be given all the reports here. From 263 to 277. 
For instance, report number 267 is on hate speech. You can just open up the report, look at the index, and have a cursory plain reading of certain headings, like impact of hate speech on freedom of expression, identifying criteria of hate speech, and review of the penal law. You must already be having your notes on hate speech. If you find something useful from here, do an add-on on your notes. Similarly, there are other important topics in the report. For example, human DNA profiling. Extremely important. You must open up the report and read certain recommendations. There is also a report on assessment of a statutory framework of tribunals in India. You must go through this report as well. You don't have to read everything in the report. Just go through the last section, recommendations. Directly go there and at least pick some important recommendations. It will take only one sitting. Even if you just read recommendations of 15 reports, it will be hardly 2-3 pages. If you do it in a steadfast manner, only one sitting of 2.5 to 3 hours it will take to go through important recommendations of all the reports. It will be worthwhile for the mains exam, trust me. There is an article on the FAQ section in today's The Hindu. Why are talks on 1.5 degree Celsius at a cliff edge at COP27? See, after the ratification of Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015, and this happened at COP21, there was focus on voluntary national actions under the concept of nationally determined contribution. The target of Paris Agreement on Climate Change was to keep the average global temperature rise from the level of pre-industrial era well below 2 degrees Celsius and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Meaning by the end of this century, our global average temperature should not be more than 2 degrees Celsius more than what it was in the pre-industrial era. And we shall try our best to keep it within 1.5 degrees Celsius rise to the level of pre-industrial era by the end of this century. But the article is saying that this target of 1.5 degrees Celsius is at cliff edge. The scientific community is losing hope that the temperature can at all be controlled. The researchers, they are increasingly believing that the uncontrollable tipping point will arrive. It will arrive soon, leading to catastrophic climate change. Many scientific reports from the UN has been released ahead of COP27. They all suggest that there is a very narrow window available to close the emission gap we will talk about emission gap in a short while, but there's a very narrow window to close this emission gap and prevent the rise in average temperature beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Very prominent scientist, Johan Rockstrom, he has suggested that key tipping points, tipping points are those moments that cascade into irreversible change. It has domino effect on other elements of biosphere, like for example, monsoon or heat waves. The scientist is saying that the key tipping points, like the potential Greenland ice sheet collapse, West Antarctic ice sheet collapse, the removal of boreal permafrost, or the death of tropical coral reef, they all are expected to happen even if, even if we walk on the path of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So even this target is not good enough. Even the most optimistic report in this regard, the sixth assessment report of IPCC. This report of IPCC has good confidence in the, the near-term targets till 2040. They shall be achieved by the countries according to this report. But still the biodiversity loss, the Arctic ice loss, the threat to coral settlements, infrastructural damage, conflicts, migration, they all are bound to happen. And beyond 2040, the picture that even IPCC portrays is very, very grim. There will be 20% decline in the irrigation water available. The report says that by the end of the century, 18% of the land species would go extinct. The report that has high confidence that the targets will be achieved, even that report is saying that the picture is very grim. Now, there's one very important report of UNEP, Emission Gap Report. The emission gap report says that although certain countries have updated their nationally determined contribution, and this new and updated nationally determined contribution only take 7.5% off the predicted 2030 emission. 
it cut down the emission only by 7.5%. But to achieve the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius as stated in the Paris goal, the cutoff in emission should have been 55%. That is why this target of 1.5% is at cliff. We are almost going to lose this target. UNEP's emission gap report says that the climate mitigation promises of the countries as it stands presently will take us on the path of 2.7 degrees Celsius. The target to keep the global average temperature within 2 degrees Celsius of pre-industrial era by the end of this century will not be met. Rather, the global average temperature will be 2.7 degrees Celsius more than the pre-industrial era. Emission gap report also says that the net zero pledges that some countries have done, there are around 50 countries including European Union, that have pledged for net zero emission by certain years, by certain time and different countries have different target year for that. But even these pledges will only reduce the target temperature by the end of the century by 0.5 degrees Celsius. So instead of landing to 2.7 degrees Celsius, if these net zero pledges, they are met, even then, we will land to 2.2 degrees Celsius rise in global average temperature. India, by the way, has not pledged for net zero emission anytime soon. In COP25 last year, we have gave new targets. And in that, the net zero emission for India is targeted to be achieved in 2070. These are other targets that India made at COP26 last year that you must, must know. India has increased the target of non-fossil fuel capacity to be achieved by 2030 to 500 gigawatt. And by 2030, India will achieve 50% of its energy requirement from renewable energy. So the carbon emission in the new target has been reduced by 1 billion ton, effectively reducing Indian economy's carbon intensity to less than 45% by 2030. So these are our targets and you have to have them on your fingertips. UNEP in its global emission gap report has done a detailed analysis, a glimpse of which we will have here. See the pathway that we shall follow with conditional nationally determined pledge that includes net zero emission would be this. This is around 2.8 degrees Celsius more than the pre-industrial era. If we have to go on this pathway of 2 degrees Celsius, meaning keeping the rise in global average temperature to within 2 degrees Celsius, then we have to cut down our emission further. And this gap in the present emission and this targeted emission is the emission gap report all about. This is huge gap of 13 gigaton CO2. And the aspiration to keep the temperature within 1.5 degrees Celsius would be hugely huge. From the present conditional nationally determined contribution, we have to cut down the emission by 25 gigaton CO2. Because of this huge emission gap, the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius is at the cliff. The only hope, and that's a very bleak, grim hope, is that by 2025, the emissions globally must peak. And from here, a sharp turn must be taken to reach to this target. So the focus of negotiation at COP27 are twofold. First of all, there are countries demanding for loss and damage payments from the richer industrialized nations because obviously per capita emission from these countries are more. Peru, even recently Pakistan and more recently India also has filed some cases for loss and damage payments. So we'll have to see what mechanism comes out from the negotiation if at all. And the second is a sharp move away from fossil fuels to peak their emission by 2025. The target is hanging from the cliff. If we can achieve this, only then the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius can be achieved. There is an explained article, India's first private satellite vehicle to launch on November 15, Skyroot Aerospace. This company based in Hyderabad, it has developed a launch vehicle named as Vikram as a tribute to Vikram Sarabhai for his contribution in space sector. So India's first privately developed launch vehicle is Vikram. And the first launch by this Vikram is going to happen on November 15th. The name of the mission under which the launch vehicle Vikram will be launching satellite is Prarambh, meaning the beginning. In this mission, Vikram launch vehicle will carry two Indian satellite and one foreign satellite. It will not place satellite in the orbit 
but rather it will be a suborbital flight. In the suborbital flight, as the name suggests, satellites are not placed in the orbit. The speed of the launch vehicle is not so high that it takes the satellite into orbit, but it is high enough that it goes into outer space. So launch vehicle leaves the surface of the Earth, touches the border of the atmosphere, and it comes back. It does not go all the way up into so high in the space that it starts orbiting the Earth. So it goes up and it comes back. Many of the launch vehicle are designed for the purpose of suborbital flight. Many of the crewed mission requires suborbital flight. Many experiments are conducted, many pictures of the space are taken in a suborbital flight. And it's also a good way to get started for Skyroot Aerospace in its journey of launching satellites in the space. Skyroot has developed the launch vehicle named as Vikram. It has various variants that the Skyroot will be using in the coming time. Vikram 1, Vikram 2, Vikram 3. But the one that will be used day after tomorrow for launching satellite is Vikram S. Vikram S, S stands for suborbital. Vikram S will be a single stage suborbital launch vehicle. But very soon, new variants will come up. Vikram 1, 2 and 3. The first one, Vikram 1, will have the payload capacity for sun-synchronous polar orbit as 290 kg and in low Earth orbit as 480 kg. And with upgradation in the engine technology, in Vikram 2 and 3, the, the payload capacity will proportionally increase. Just to give you a little bit of perspective, in PSLV, the payload capacity in sun-synchronous polar orbit is 1750 kg. The same for GSLV Mark 3 is around 8 ton, 8000 kg. In the orbit of similar distance, in Vikram, it will be 290 kg. So you understand, this is for small satellite. Small satellite weighs in the range of 5 to 1000 kg. But the demand for small satellites in the coming time will exponentially increase. Put in that perspective, this upcoming first flight of India's first private launch vehicle is remarkable. Although Vikram S is single stage suborbital launch vehicle, but Vikram 1 will have three solid fuel powered stages. And then there will be a final stage which they have named as Raman engine after Sir C. V. Raman. So there will be three solid stages and then in the final stage there will be Raman engine. Raman engine will be powered by two fuels, monomethyl hydrazine, a variant of hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. These two obviously would be in liquid phase. And you understand the final stage of a rocket is always in liquid stage. The reason is in the final stage you have to do a lot of maneuvering. You have to control the thirst for landing. You also have to control the thirst for proper orbital placement. And control is not there in solid stage. In solid stage the fuel burns in an uncontrollable manner just like your solid fuels on earth like coal burns. You cannot control that. It will give you very high amount of thirst and burn uncontrollably. So in the first stage, when the rocket has to come out of the influence of Earth, in that stage, huge amount of thirst is required. So solid stage is best suited in the initial phase of rocket launch. But towards the end of the journey of the rocket, more maneuvering and adjustment is required and hence you require liquid stage. If I can just bring you back here, in PSLV you know there are four stages. Solid liquid, solid liquid. In GSLV Mark III, there are three stages, solid, liquid and cryogenic. In the cryogenic engine as well, the fuel are in liquid state. So it is kind of liquid engine. So in the first stage will always be solid stage and the last stage will always be liquid stage. Vikram launch vehicles will also have capabilities of multi-orbit insertion which is a requirement of launch vehicle launching small satellites because it may carry multiple satellites and it then must have the capability of multi-orbit insertion. The higher variants Vikram 2 and Vikram 3 will also be capable of interplanetary missions. It is claimed by Sky Rocket Aerospace that Vikram rocket can be assembled and launched within 24 hours from any launch site and it will also have lowest cost in the small satellite segment. See, this is no mean feat. A startup has started to launch satellite in India. Things that Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they have been doing. So it is like we have entered into space 4.0. And if things goes on really well from here, India has a chance of becoming leader in the space sector. 
the potential of private entrepreneurs and startups in space sector in India is huge. The concept of Space 4.0, as you understand, is analogous and linked with Industrial Revolution 4.0, where everything is intertwined. Not only that, at the level of administration and governance, private sector, public sector, NGOs, individuals in society, they all collaborate together. It is estimated that the global space business is around $400 billion and it will go at least to $1 trillion by end of 2040. But presently, India spends only around $1.8 billion. So the potential of growth is huge. Even though ISRO is doing exceptionally well, but India, on an average, launches 5 to 7 satellites per year. And this number for China is around 15 to 17. ISRO is restricted in the number of launches every year because of low in-house capacity. Privatization of the space sector and, and more participation of private industries and startups that can help ISRO by around 30 to 40 percent of their work. Even presently, ISRO take help of private sector in terms of procurement of sensors and assembly of microprocessors. But this collaboration can be enhanced even more, where ISRO can focus on more advanced missions, like human space missions, and other work like development and assembly of launch vehicles that can come in the private sector hands. Private sector obviously will bring more innovation, as has been done globally in terms of reusable launch vehicles. The company Skyrocket that has developed Vikram has conviction that sooner a day will come when launch vehicle services will become as easy as booking a cab. In the coming times, the demand of launch vehicle and satellite data is going to increase exponentially. The new technology of artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, the ongoing Industrial Revolution 4.0, the demand for imaging, maps, satellite data, for urban planning, for agriculture, for disaster management, everything is going to increase. This will call for higher throughputs, improved technology in terms of radar, better thermal imaging, and more demand for launch vehicles. And all this cannot be done alone by one central agency, ISRO. So the doors for private sector in space sector had to be opened. And India has done that already in June 2020. India has opened up the space sector for private sector. India has allowed the participation of Indian private sector in the entire domain of space activities, from the stage of aiding the development of satellites, to launching satellites, to providing satellite-based services. Everything now can be done by the private sector. And once you open the sector, the next obvious thing is to regulate it. And for that purpose, a Space Activities Bill 2017 was brought. It remained actually at the draft stage. And that is the status that it still holds. The obvious next thing to do once you have the legislation is to have the organization that will do the regulation. Although this is still incomplete, but we have the body, New Space India Limited. It is under Department of Space. It was established in 2019. One of the prime job is to get global customers in terms of getting their satellites to be launched by us, and also in general terms of getting the space-based services in terms of supply of goods or any other collaboration for global customers. There's another very important body, Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center. This perhaps will become the body for regulating the private sector. Although the defined role for regulation of private sector is not there because we do not have a Space Activities Act yet. Presently in space, Promote the private sector and bring private investment in space sector. New Space India Limited, this largely in future will take the role of promoter and in space should take the role of regulator. But these things are not clearly defined because we do not have the legislation on table. The hand-holding, training, mentoring, that role will be done by ISRO apart from the core job of ISRO. But then there are still various challenges for private sector participation in space industry. First of all, the private industry in any sector, they have crowding in when government expenditure itself is very high. Whether that is infrastructure or education, in any industry, private participation is increased only by increased investment of the government. And as we have observed earlier, the investment of government in space sector is very low. US spends around 10 times more, China spends around six times more. We still do not have a very clear legislative framework. 
the draft space activities bill that was introduced way back in 2017 has still not been passed as an act yet when the law is not very clear the regulation obviously is also not very clear however india is party to outer space treaty and according to this treaty the nations require supervision of space activities within its borders but india although being the member of outer space treaty has not legislated any law but india is bound to do it as and when the private sector participation will increase this thing will come in but since the law has not been passed yet there is little clarity as to how the regulation will happen so the regulatory challenge is still remain to be seen but it's still there and that may create hindrances in robust participation of private sector private sector always want clarity in policy and regulation and that must be done before the government can expect full throttle participation from the private industry because of absence of policy framework or regulatory framework it is also not very clear as to how the disputes will be settled private sector when they start launching vehicles from india and also from foreign countries obviously when you have transaction when you do business there are disputes bound to occur how the dispute settlement would happen we do not know so the private participation even though that may happen but the foreign collaboration still could be very restricted because of lack of clarity in dispute settlement mechanism you would remember the famous anthrix devas satellite deal that got cancelled and then anthrix had to be dissolved as per the judgment of a tribunal of international chamber of commerce india owes nearly 1.2 billion dollar to devas multimedia there was an agreement of launch of satellite and then we didn't launch and hence this dispute spiraled up when private sector will start participating more and start launching more and more satellites in the orbit there will be a question of management of such a vast constellation of satellites because at global level if any conflict occurs the responsibility or the management of that has to be done by the government we cannot expect any private industry to be engaging in any kind of conflict resolution with another nation and this kind of conflict can also give rise to future space war so these questions remains completely unanswered as, as to how the government is going to handle these although the private participation has started but the problem of brain drain especially in high technology sector like space sector still continues space sector is capital intensive there are few startups who are doing well here and that has happened because of hand holding and technological assistance by isro but there are only a few of them the prime hindrance is the capital and there is no provision of giving fund to the private industry new startups engaging in space sector so what needs to be done things that we have seen are going wrong that needs to be corrected and what is that we need to have a national space activities legislation we do not have it yet the space activity bill is still pending it needs to be passed and before it gets passed there has to be proper consultation with all stakeholders once we have policy in place we have laws in place we must have regulatory architecture in place there has to be an independent tribunal to adjudicate disputes we need to have an independent regulator in space or any other body must be given the role of regulating the private sector new space india limited must not only look for getting foreign customers but its role must be enhanced to find a new role for private industry for example getting in collaboration with private sector to find some space services that startups may give in rural india so not only finding new customers but finding new end users using space technology will expand the space sector itself government of india should seriously consider enhancing the spending towards the sector given the impressive growth and results that isro had india should be collaborating more with countries like us russia even australia the ppp model that has been huge success in infrastructure that also can be adopted in space industry isro can do hand holding and train them to develop a launch vehicle like isro's workhorse polar satellite launch vehicle pslv humanity has just begun to understand this universe and with that the beginning of a space sector also has just began to happen there is a huge opportunity of private industry to participate in the sector but we need to have policy readiness legislative readiness regulatory readiness fiscal readiness administrative readiness and the spirit of vikram sarabhai now the time has come to test what you have been doing since last 40 minutes on your screen you have set of 12 questions take 2 minutes of time not more than that to answer all of them then and only then you listen to the discussion further
but I know very well many of you will not do it but at least when I read the question you listen to the question figure out the answer for that either in true or in false make sure you at least do this the first statement is first constitutional amendment was done on the recommendation of law commission of India first law commission of India after independence was constituted in 1955 and the first constitutional amendment was done in 1951 so this doesn't seem to be possible in the linear flow of time only a supreme court judge can head the law commission of India whenever there is only in the statement you have to be very cautious because mostly the statement would be incorrect but not always but yes most of the time usually the chairman of the law commission of India is either a retired supreme court judge or a retired chief justice of a high court statement again is incorrect cabinet secretary is the ex officio chairman of the law commission well cabinet secretary is not the ex officio chairman law and legislative secretaries these two are the ex officio member of the commission incorrect statement law commission can so more to review a law or policy yes it's an independent reviewing body it can so more to take any issue it wants to related to legislation or policy issues law commission can provide research to any foreign country it can if the term of reference is given by the law ministry not on its own but on the liberal reading of the statement it is true law commission submits its report to the president well we haven't seen this but you must be aware of the bodies submitting report to the president law commission submits report to the government because you know it's appointed by the law ministry it is not constituted by the president so by extension it must not be submitting report to the president statement is false RTI Act 2005 was result of recommendation of Law Commission report. We have seen earlier many achievements of Law Commission in terms of its recommendation getting accepted. But RTI was not one of that. RTE indeed is, but not RTI. Related to RTI, you must be knowing Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan. The social movement by this organization resulted in the fruits of RTI. Emission gap report is published by World Economic Forum. We have seen this emission gap report is a very important report of UNEP. Statement is false again. India has set the target of net zero emission to be achieved by 2040. The target is to be achieved by 2070. India is a member of Outer Space Treaty. It's correct statement. But despite being a member of Outer Space Treaty, India do not have a national legislation to regulate private sector participation. Vikram 1 launch vehicle will have cryogenic engine at the first stage. Cryogenic engine with huge difficulty, huge endeavor, ISRO has been able to design. It's a very complicated craft. So immediately handling it over to private sector doesn't seem likely. Moreover, Vikram 1 launch vehicle will be used for small satellite. So even from design perspective, it doesn't require cryogenic engine. Cryogenic engine is, through, is using in GSLV, not even in PSLV. And the payload capacity of Vikram 1 will be even less than PSLV. So it doesn't make sense that Vikram 1 will be using cryogenic engine. India has allowed FDI in space sector in the automatic route. FDI is there but through government approval route. On case-to-case -case basis, government allows FDI in space sector presently. With increased private participation, there are demands that space sector be open for FDI. But presently, the statement will stand incorrect. Thanks for being with me. Hope you learned something today. Goodbye. Take care.